Thanks very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be able to present remotely. Uh, makes it convenient for a lot of people and uh, hopefully provides more information and access. So um, as uh, has been said, I'm Peter, the Education Manager of the Nautical Archaeology Society. I'll be talking about how our organisation made the most of the pandemic and actually benefited maritime heritage during a time of world upheaval. And just because my internet's a little bit unstable, I'm going to stop the video. Sorry, my slides are just not catching up. So uh, as you can see from the bottom of each slide, I've broken my presentation into three segments. Let's start with what our organization did before the world seemed to end in our pre-pandemic phase. Firstly, I thought it would be good to explain what the Nautical Archaeology Society is. We're a non-government training organization and registered charity. It's our primary mission to research, record, and protect our threatened underwater and coastal heritage for the benefit of everyone. Our organization's logo is based on the pot that's shown here in the picture. It's from the 7th century BC, and it's from Cyprus, and it shows merchants loading a vessel, a ship. So who is NAS? Well, we have only a small number of paid staff, as you can see here from the, the four pictures. We've got our CEO, Mark Beattie Edwards, me as the education manager, our admin officer, Sarah Hassan, and our journal editor, Athena Trakadas. But we have a very large number of volunteers who work with us. They are trustees, tutors, course hosts, divers, field workers, researchers, and many, many more helping us with skills that they have from their life, but also learning skills from us. Where is NAS? We're on the south coast. Our office is based in Fort Cumberland in Portsmouth, but we operate all around the UK. And we also operate internationally. Uh, for that matter, we have organisations all around the world teaching our courses, as you can see from the blue dots on this map. We currently have 31 government departments, NGOs and diving institutes in our 18 countries teaching a local version of our courses. We want to make sure that they are reaching their broadest audience and help them create citizen scientists to protect and investigate their local underwater cultural heritage. And you can see the blue dot down in the furthest right hand corner. Um, one of the reasons why I'm presenting remotely is because I've just returned from Australia where I was visiting some of our international training partners there. So what is our education program? It's an internationally recognized and accredited qualification scheme that has trained over 20,000 divers and non-divers, academics and avocationals. Over the almost four decades that's been running, it's constantly adapted and changed to outside pressures and inside recommendations. So we were well-versed in being able to adapt to a pandemic, although it was still quite a challenge. So our course, our, our education program builds on knowledge and experience and promotes awareness, education, skills and training, and most importantly, responsible access to heritage for all. We want everyone to have access to the heritage, not just an exclusive group. Here's a quick summary of our syllabus and the qualifications. So working from left to right, you start off with your foundation in maritime archaeology. And then after that, there's the, the other two, certificate and award. So the foundation is a standardized entry level training course, and there's a multitude of ways to progress through the final two qualifications. As you can see from the boxes below the two qualifications, you can do online courses, maritime archaeology courses, blogs, field work, talks and lectures, research, attend conferences like this one. And that proved to be very good, this flexibility in gaining qualifications. It proved to be very flexible during the pandemic so that people could still continue to progress through our qualification schemes, uh, doing a, a range of things. So one of the first ways that we adapted our education program was in the types of sites and environments that we worked on. While we started off as a training organization for divers four decades ago, we've expanded to include foreshore archeology span in our remit. This is because we consider it just as important an area of maritime heritage that needs preserving and protecting. But on a practical level, it's both we needed to attract a new demographic of members to our organization, that is non-divers. And also we needed a, an opportunity for field work for our existing members, for those who couldn't dive anymore or weren't inclined to. Our membership is uh, getting older and not always passing their diving medicals every year. So we wanted them to still be active in archeology span even if they couldn't go underwater. So this is one of the first ways that our education program has adapted to changing situations. Our entry level training, as I mentioned before, 
uh, involves skills days where we teach basic recording and survey skills to make our members useful volunteers on archaeological sites. Once again, we used to just teach the, the course underwater. We used inland diving centres, and you can see two photos of that on the left-hand side of the screen. So they, they start off by practising on a practice wreck. You can see that that's in the top left-hand corner. That's a fake wreck we set up in the car park or various locations, wherever it's convenient. And then they actually get to practise their skills underwater, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. But we also work in classrooms if that's need, needs being. So you can see there's some people learning in the top right hand corner in a classroom setting. And also we teach on foreshore sites uh, on the intertidal zone, as you can see in the bottom uh, right hand corner. So it's very flexible depending on who we're training and what is needed. We also run specialty courses. Once you've done your entry level, you can do a range of different specialty courses. And I'll just go through a few examples. We teach over 70 different types of courses, and here's just a few of them. So on the top left-hand corner going across, um, we've taught people how to use a faro arm recording system uh, at the Newport Ship in Wales. There's a numismatics course that we teach that's very popular. There's artifact illustration. Uh, photogrammetry is the next image you see. The, the top right-hand corner is make your own ROV course. That's always quite exciting and fun to do. Bottom left-hand corner is Canon recording course. The next one is conservation, flint napping, and bow construction and archery. So there's quite a range of different um, courses that we teach, but they're all related to maritime heritage. So this broadening of our archaeological site remit is also reflected in another adaptation to our program. In 2015, we thought we'd follow the example of other diving organisations and start to teach our theory components online. That leaves more time for practical training when it comes to face-to-face -face courses. And that's proved very popular. So you can see here that people start off with discover maritime archaeology and then they can choose whether to do foreshore and coastal archaeology or underwater archaeology. And it's all done online so people can do it whenever they like uh, at their own convenience. Two of the other ways we employ to educate people is through our journal and webinars. And we've been publishing our International Journal of Nautical Archaeology since the early 1970s. To make it more relevant, to a wider audience, in 2019, we got funding to run a series of webinars based on themes and papers from our journal to try and bring it to a broader audience. You can see from the four webinars and their topics in this image um, that most of them, um, that they're quite, range, are quite broad in the range that they cover. And you can see that, that all of these webinars took place before the pandemic. So we were doing this kind of format before it became popular uh, when the pandemic hit. So we were well versed in being able to, to do that. So that's a very quick summary of how our education program worked up until 2020, and then the world ended as the pandemic struck, but we soldiered on. So here's what we did. Well, first of all, as soon as lockdown hit, we worked to our strengths and used a method we already knew how to deliver, which was the webinars. But we took it to a weekly half hour lunchtime format this time, and it was aimed at a general audience, but with very exclusive and pre prestigious presenters on up-to-date topics. So we presented 20 talks and they were incredibly well received. So these are the little um, adverts for each of the talks we had over the 20 weeks. You can see in this graph that there were some interesting trends over the, the initial pandemic lockdown. The blue line is the number of people that wanted to attend our courses and signed up to do so. But you can see that that's quite different to the people that actually took place, took part and, and attended. And that's the orange line. So there were the people that took part and attended each lunchtime. And then you can see that there is a grey line, which is the people who have watched our recorded videos on YouTube. So it, it's, it's expanded our remit and our influence because people have been able to watch the videos beyond the, the half hour live session. And we're continuing to increase and um, uh, influence people. And they can learn more about maritime heritage through these videos beyond the pandemic. So we also had to turn our courses online. The Nautical Archaeology Society has a wide range of courses, as you have seen before, and they're very practical in nature. So turning them online was a bit of a challenge, but we did manage. Uh, it was tough to start off with. The first one that we had scheduled was pretty soon after lockdown happened. So we had a quick turnaround time to make our Marine Conservation Society Sea Search for Rex course into an online format. So I worked with the tutors and we actually reasonably easily turned it into an online format. You can see one of the uh, participants there with his guidebook learning how to identify fish 
and uh, identify seaweed online so that we can go diving on that uh, with a, a greater knowledge next time. We didn't manage to work out how to do the practical, but at least we got the theory done. So that's the main thing. Um, as I'd already programmed an entire year of events, I did my best to turn as many of them online so that people were still able to benefit from our learning experiences. I knew the conservation for marine finds course would be a challenge as a very practical course. We'd run it many times before. But in collaboration with the tutors from Historic England, we managed to make an online theory course that was engaging. The online delivery made it internationally accessible, which means we had a number of people attend from overseas, and also the cheaper online price made it very attractive to university students. And that's a group that we normally can't work with because it's too expensive for them to attend. So that was a, a double bonus for us, international people and university students finally getting to do our courses. Some courses that I had planned already really lent themselves to online learning. Um, and this was particularly the case for the Lloyd's Online Archives course. It turned out to be much easier for expert tutors to give a live tour of the online archives and then assign course participants research tasks so that they could learn how to use the archives and navigate them themselves. And they researched historic vessels and wrecks and they were given assignments and then they had to submit to them during the course and had live feedback feedback given to them by the expert tutors. So this was a very successful course and worked well in the online environment. It allowed participants to have hands-on learning and finish the course with confidence and the ability to use the archives for their own research project. As a result of this, and the several times we've had to repeat it since because it's been so popular, a large number of people found a new outlet to be productive during lockdown and Maritime Heritage definitely benefited from that. In keeping with the theme of providing useful skills to occupy people during lockdown, we turned an in-person project into a digital one by training people how to catalogue an important collection. Over the last few decades, Southampton University students have used various archaeological methods to record a large collection of ethnographic boats. The boat collection has been sold, sadly, and dispersed, but the archive remains. Since 2019, Southampton University students and NAS members have physically been cataloguing the archive of plans photographs, etc. But the lockdown switched to working with the online collection of digitised scans and photogrammetry models. And a large number of people from all over the world were trained to assist with that project. So now that people are used to working from home, the cataloguing continues in digital form. And eventually we will catalogue the whole, pro a whole uh, archive and we'll get there eventually. One of the online courses that we developed encouraged people to do lockdown compliant fieldwork. So that was crowdsourcing information about anchors. This course, taught, this course taught people from around the world how to record and research anchors and add this information to our online database. As a result of this course, 40 people from 10 countries had a genuine purpose for their limited outside, outside exercise, and it also benefited maritime heritage as lots more anchors were recorded on waterfronts, harbours, pubs, and outside public places. And this information was shared with others through our big anchor project database. Another bonus of having this course online was that we could get expert guest lecturers from around the world to share their expertise, and we didn't have to pay for their expensive plane tickets. So it made the course a lot more uh, meaty and interesting for people to attend with that international component. So we found that people were keen to find productive ways of spending their time at home during lockdown. Our report writing course that's been held many times before but not as, has never been really very popular, seems a bit dry, but people were very keen to attend it during lockdown. Many people wanted to use their time of captivity to catch up on writing up their exciting discoveries of the past or to take the opportunity to learn a new skill and get, time, get prepared for reporting on the field work in the future. So the report writing course was a great success. And this was further demonstrated by our incredibly successful Welsh Rec Web Research Project. I have to say that slowly. During a research project in 20, 2001 to 2009, the Melbourne Archaeological Diving Unit created a database of 453 shipwrecks just in the north end of Cardigan Bay in northwest Wales. Lots of wrecks, very small area, never researched. And so most of the entries on this list really needed a lot of detail and investigation. So as a result of this project and associated training courses, such as the report writing one that I just mentioned, 73 people from around the world researched and wrote reports on 264 wrecks just from this small part of Wales. 
So this is a massive increase in knowledge about the maritime heritage of this area. And all this information is now freely available online through our website and has also been added to the local heritage databases. None of this research would ever have been done if people hadn't been trapped at home during the pandemic. And now this is a method that hopefully we'll be able to replicate, although whether we'll be able to get the enthusiasm and the uh, detailed reports, we're not so sure unless we have another lockdown. I'm not sure it's worth it though. So as you can see, we ran lots of courses on, uh, online and a range of subjects and never had any trouble getting bookings. People were bored and needed something to do during lockdown. So they came to us from all over the world. And to maintain, maintain our reputation for providing and practical training, we always managed to have some sort of practical exercise for participants to do, still online, of course. And then they would submit it and get feedback. This also helped to make sure that we weren't just committing death by PowerPoint for our courses. We also took the opportunity to refresh our entry level e-learning courses during the pandemic. This was because we finally had the time to sit at the desk and get the work done. There was also relevant pandemic related online learning support funding through Historic England. So far, our e-learning courses have been incredibly successful with almost 1,000 people from 100 countries completing it. And we make sure that the course is as interesting as possible and engaging, and it's still possible to include interactivity in our courses. So here's an uh, examples of some animations to illustrate more complex concepts. This is a representation of LIDAR. And here is a little animation of how uh, different types of rec can be uh, created in a legal sense. So this is part of our legal, our legislation model, module, which can, can be considered quite dry, but uh, it's very important, essential learning. And so this little illustration helps to make it more interesting and memorable for learning the different types of uh, rec, jetsam, flotsam, whether it's derelict or lagan. And surprisingly, it is possible to demonstrate fieldwork techniques without getting out in the field. So this animation shows a diver laying out control points and then stringing a baseline between them. This would be quite difficult to um, demonstrate in an underwater environment, but here's an image to show it's easy. And then this is some divers demonstrating how to do baseline offset survey. And of course, you then go and practice it in the field and it's a lot more easy once you've seen a visualization of it. <clears throat> Part of the COVID funding we received from Historic England involved developing specialty courses in the e-learning environment. This canon research and recording course was one that we developed. It provided technical, historical and archaeological information about canon and teaches useful skills for identifying their origin and date when they're found on an archaeological site. While this was an online theory course, it was always intended to run a practical course afterwards so that people would get that practical experience. But we did work with our e-learning developer to create some fun animations to make the content easier to understand for the theory component. And this is a little il illustration of a cannon being fired. So it, it's quite fun to watch, very informative, and also much easier and cheaper than trying to get a reconstruction or a, a reenactment group to actually launch it, uh, to, to fire a cannon. And unfortunately, you can't hear the sound effects, but uh, you're about to hear a big boom when it's fired. And that's always fun to have in an online course, particularly people aren't expecting it. it really shakes them up and makes them, there you go, there's the boom that you can't hear makes people sit up and take notice. So now we're finishing with the third and final segment, the post-pandemic world. Well, hopefully it's post-pandemic. So we started off with, what, once again, what we knew, a webinar. And this time they were more academic. I'm sorry, is someone saying something? Uh, I'm, I'm on the route home, yep. You can, see that there were, you can see that there's lots of webinars that we held, but unfortunately they weren't as popular this time because lots of people are now having better things to do they can, now that they can get out of the house. We also have uh, continuing with our online practicals, our online courses with practicals, and you can see here's a timetable for our archaeological illustration course, which met, um, melds theory lectures online with practical courses that you do from your own home. And we also continue to do our, we're experimenting with different methods of online delivery. We ran a, a GIS course. And to start off with, we thought that it would be best to have it over two days so that we didn't overwhelm people. 
with too much uh, information. And so there was theory lessons interspersed with practical courses, still, of course, doing the practical courses from your own home. And then we decided to try and jam it all together into one day. Both of them worked in different methods, um, in different ways. So it's something we can still experiment with. But one thing that we have come up with is that we have lots of international people attending our courses, particularly from the Mediterranean and the Middle East. There are a few language barriers there and also internet and power are not so reliable in that part of the world. So we always provide access for to the recordings of the courses for people so they can catch up and not be disadvantaged no matter where they live in the world. Um, I've already mentioned the Lloyd's Register Online Archive. It's a continual success and we get people to do practical courses uh, or practical exercises with information we send them in, in person, uh, sorry, online, and then they can uh, finish the course uh, online. And we now have a different method where we have pre-recorded videos so that people can do the learning at their own pace. But then we have an, a live section where the tutors are there on hand, the expert tutors, to provide more information and some practical courses and live feedback. So that's a really good way of minimizing the face-to-face, -face, uh, or not the face-to-face, -face, the actual in-person live session so that now that people aren't so keen to sit in front of a computer for eight hours a day. And of course, we have in-person with restrictions courses. So that's at the beginning when restrictions started to ease, we still had people wearing masks, having uh, all of their hand sanitizers uh, in place and getting vaccinations and things. Um, and that worked really well. And now we can have in-person without restrictions courses, although we still maintain the highest of safety and have uh, get out clauses if the world health situation deteriorates and we think that it's a risk to, to keep, keep um, have our courses attending, uh, keep our courses um, in place. So you can see that NAS not only survived the pandemic, but was able to thrive and find new opportunities for managing and researching our maritime heritage. Thanks very much for coming on this pre-pandemic, pandemic and post-pandemic journal journey with NAS and I. Perhaps you've seen something that we do that you could also implement for yourselves in ensuring that our heritage continues to be cared for and investigated, no matter what the world health situation is and no matter how wet or soggy your heritage is. Thank you very much.